I will speak for Lithium and, and a number of uh, players in the industry have responded and we're all in agreement that unless there is severe EV demand destruction, which we don't think is likely as China comes out of the COVID lockdowns, you're not going to see uh, a material pullback in Lithium demand or prices. My next guest is Rodney Hooper. He's a partner at RK Equity Advisors. Rodney, welcome. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you, Rodney. Uh, your newsletters and podcasts are quite popular these days, focused on investing in battery metals. And uh, I'm curious as to what uh, what is the sort of temperature out there among investors for battery metals after Goldman Sachs came out and said that the bull market in battery metals had, for the time being, run its course. I guess the timing of the report sort of landed with some other broader economic fundamentals that have been quite challenging, like inflation and, and growth rates and oil prices. But um, I won't speak for the other battery metals, but I will speak for lithium and, and a number of uh, players in the industry have responded. And we're all in agreement that unless there is severe EV demand destruction, which we don't think is likely as China comes out of the COVID lockdowns, you're not going to see uh, a material pullback in lithium demand or prices. So. For those of us that uh, have been following the industry for a long time and uh, keeping a close check on how much investment has been made upstream into mining, we are in strong disagreement with their findings. But at the moment, the markets in general and lithium shares have, uh, have uh, taken a hit. I was surprised to see that in Goldman Sachs on the one hand because of the huge divergence between future supply as it currently exists on the drawing boards of companies around the world and the demand for lithium on the battery side. Uh, and I sort of had to conclude that much like they have, uh, you know, basically talked their book, uh, that it was more or less just that. So then in the broader economic context, do you think that a recession, should it emerge to be the case globally, would have a demand destruction impact on the demand for electric vehicles in any sense? At the moment, the waiting list for EVs is insane. It's sort of 12 to 18 months. And if you look at who typically buys an electric vehicle for now, before it is very sort of broad based across all uh, segments of the market, it's more the upper income end. So I would say there would be some element of immunity to demand even during a recession. So I can't see the economics of owning an EV are better than uh, owning an internal combustion engine if you drive for reasonable distances per day. So um, we can't see uh, demand destruction. There are other things like government legislation and in China, certain cities where number plates are restricted, where you can't you know, not even allowed to drive in certain cities and so on. And the same, you know, is starting to appear in the UK, et cetera. So there is some uh, government, le you know, legislation back uh, backstop for EV demand as well. So we can't see it, but of course a recession might on the margin. But right now, can you, uh, you know, can 12 to 18 months of uh, waiting times evaporate? I, I can't see it. To what extent then do you believe that the cost of electric vehicles could be impacted negatively by rising lithium costs to the point where they become less attainable for consumers? What we're saying, and, and for most part of the industry, is we're not disagreeing with Goldman Sachs that seventy-five or eighty thousand dollars a ton is a long-term price. It isn't, um, and more will come online. I think that as the world normalizes, whatever that means, uh, in terms of supply chains, logistics coming out of COVID, on a longer term view, we see um, you know, lithium prices remaining at incentive levels, but lower than levels they are now. And, and also with production volumes and efficiency and battery tech efficiency in terms of processing and scalability that you will see EVs and EV costs uh, and comparative costs are becoming compelling again in the sort of medium term. In terms of future lithium supply, 
Uh, where do we expect to see the largest growth reliably? That, I guess, is a part of the debate. Um, you've got uh, South America with the brands, despite what Argentina goes through and, and proposed legislation, etc. There's always going to be projects coming online and growth there. SQM and, and Albemarle in, uh, in Chile and potentially some new products. And then, of course, in safe jurisdictions like, um, you know, tier one, like Canada and Australia, you know, they are, there's teams swarming all over those looking for um, hard rock deposits. And I expect increased supply from those areas. And then Africa is becoming an emerging an emerging player. So it's, again, the debate is not around the existence of lithium. It's around the uh, existence of economically viable deposits that, you know, you can sort out the logistics and they're not too challenging from a processing perspective. You know, China has got uh, spare conversion capacity. So what they need is hard rock. Um, you know, Goldman's was insinuating that lipidolite could be a rising challenge and China brines. Um, you know, we'll see with these elevated prices, they'll certainly give it a, a try, but quality of material matters. Um, but uh, it isn't as simple as um, flicking a switch. So it is going to take time. But I, I, I do think if you look at political sensitivities and ESG concerns, if those remain, then things like low carbon power in Canada will be very appealing in uh, Quebec and Ontario and um, and uh, Australia. So, you know, countries will look to team up with those because they'll have certainty of supply. And I think South America for its political ups and downs has also been a consistent supply. Hopefully that will work itself out as well. In the South American context, there's been a lot of sort of discussion and disclosure emanating from the governments there, implying that the permitting of solar evaporation operations would be limited by the supply of water, which is competitively viewed by especially the local people who live there. And so, for example, the emerging leftist government in Chile has said that they are not going to issue any new permits for solar evaporation anywhere in Chile. So is this something that is kind of a stumbling block for bringing solar-based lithium onto the market in an increasing capacity? Look, I guess for Chile that will be a concern, but SQM is uh, already you know, executing on its expansion plans on the brownfield without having to utilize more, and, and they are actually pretty efficient at that, um, and as is Albemarle. So you're talking about new product, new projects, so that's a new supply. Um, and we think that, uh, you know, I guess in time, you know, DLE technologies can be applied at whatever level um, they need to be and uh, to minimize, um, you know, the freshwater usage. I guess, you know, there are other areas other than the Atacama that uh, contain that host lithium. And um, so, you know, for Chile, it, it might cause some minor delays, but uh, certainly in Argentina, which is where the bulk of projects, brine projects are going to come from, there have been no such issues as yet from there. Uh, so uh, I would expect, you know, future prospects to remain solid coming out of Argentina. And finally, I'm looking at the, uh, the list of the companies that uh, your company, Archaic Advisors, has advised. And I noticed that in some cases, those companies aren't necessarily around anymore in the same format that they were when they started or as they're listed here. And I'm thinking of Namaska Lithium. And Namaska Lithium is a company that uh, I've been to their site multiple times. I've, I've new management throughout the evolution of the company. And then I stepped away from the lithium space in 2017. And then when I came back, Namaska Lithium had essentially blown up. And so I'm curious as to, are the circumstances that caused Namaska Lithium to uh, essentially inflict losses on early investors, are those circumstances present in other emerging developers at this point? Namaska is somewhat of a unique case because they decided rather than to 
initiate spodumen only production and then evolve into a downstream chemical producer they decided to go for both at the same time and there was some uh, some cost issues i think that uh, the lithium from a lithium pricing perspective the environment is far more conducive to a higher for longer in our opinion in incentive pricing the the risks that carry forward or the lessons from namaska i would say would be um you know in in using inverted commas new technologies and they are you know you know dle you know it's you know what is a fingerprint every seller and every deposit is different so there are some new processing techniques and uh, and projects that are being um put forward that uh, you know that uh, you know, could possibly face the same risks as the masca as they evolve they don't deliver on timelines and on what they promised but on a on a hard rock basis on pure hard rock deposits we know that uh, the china knows how to process those um and um if you look at the uh, chem- if you look at integrated projects you know there's more experienced players that are involved even in greenfield projects so look there's always a chance of a, re- a history repeat but uh, i would say the risk sits more with unproven technologies um and uh the risk of getting your cost strong and timelines right okay ronnie well we're going to leave it there for now i really appreciate your participation today thanks for joining me thanks very much for having me on 